Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Levi. I love you, brother. <laughs> and we're going to finish up the book of Malachi today. Another small book. Uh, again, every time we finish off a book, we got a little ice cream to hang out just in celebration that we finished another book of the Bible. Uh, Malachi ends on, I would say, a sort of a bittersweet note. Bittersweet. Uh, let's go to Malachi chapter 4. We're going to look at that whole chapter. There's only six verses. A message entitled, The Son of Righteousness. Malachi chapter 4, picking up in verse 1 this morning. The Son of Righteousness. Let's stay in honor of the Word of God. He writes, For behold, the day is coming burning like an oven, and all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly, will be stubble, and the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch, but to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. And Lord, we know that it is a word which you have esteemed of even above your own name. And I pray, Lord, this morning that your word would go forth like light. Lord, as that sun rises, as that sun of righteousness shines in our heart this morning, I pray, Lord, that it would cast out the darkness, Lord, that it would cast out the distractions, and that it would bring to your people light, and that it would bring to your people life and strength today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Thank you. You can be seated. One of the most beautiful things that I found about Kansas since moving here a few years ago is the beautiful sunsets and sunrises. I mean, it's just magnificent beauty. And as that sun rises, there's just something special about it. Blackness of the night, the cold of the morning, it just starts to dissipate that coolness. And it's like that sun just brings warmth and life to everything that it touches as a new day dawns. And today, what we look at in the book of Malachi is the idea of the son of righteousness. S-U-N, the son of righteousness here is going to dispel the darkness. And I want to look at two things simply with you this morning. He's going to do a contrast. The sun is going to be rising. And there's going to be a great contrast. So let's look first this morning at the sun rising on the wicked. Look at verse 1. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. All the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. And the day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts, that will leave them neither root nor branch. Now, if you remember the context, let me pull back just for a moment. Remember last week, what's the context of this whole discussion here at the end of Malachi? The question they were asked, does it pay to serve God? That's the question that was on the table. The answer is still continuing into chapter 4. God said last week, yes, it does pay to serve God. Why? Because what? I listen, to your, I listen to them. I list them. I love them. And now he sets the record straight. Just in case we didn't get it last week, he says one more thing. And he looks into the distant future and says, yes, absolutely, it is worthy, it is right to serve Almighty God. Because in verse 5, he looks at what he calls there. Look, if you have your Bible open, verse 5, the great and dreadful day of the Lord. The great and dreadful day of the Lord. The phrase day of the Lord, interesting phrase, it's used throughout your Bible, but in the book of Malachi, from chapter 3, verse 17, to the end of the book, it's used four times. Pretty important word. What's the day of the Lord? The question. It simply speaks to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as I've told you, when you read the prophets, okay, when you look at Isaiah, Look at Jeremiah, you look at Malachi. It's as if they were seeing 
the two comings of Christ. They didn't, they didn't see it in this really tight chronological order, like this really strict timeline. It's like if you see mountains off in the distance, they look really close together, right? But as you drive closer to those mountains, you realize, wow, they're actually pretty far apart. Again, and that's why it's a little difficult to read the prophets, because they sort of bounce back and forth from the first coming to the second coming, and it's sort of like you sort of, sort of have to unravel it a little bit. But here, in the book of Malachi, it's pretty simple right here. He's speaking of a contrast. He's saying the day of the Lord is going to come, and two things are going to happen. There's going to be punishment for the wicked. There's going to be deliverance for the righteous, and it's going to come through the person of the Son of Righteousness. What a title for the Messiah, isn't it? We know him as the Prince of Peace. We know him as the Everlasting Father. But how about this title for him? The Son of Righteousness. I like that title. It's beautiful, is it not? Think about the Son for a moment, okay? This next Advent season, we're going, to, we're going to be so tired of hearing about light. But we're going to talk about light. But think about the sun for a moment. What does that sun do? It gives to you light. It gives everything on this planet Earth life. You take the sun away from planet Earth, what do you have? Death. You have nothing. But we also know what? The sun is a pretty dangerous thing, isn't it? Remember October 14th, just this couple months ago, we were at Travis's house. And remember that eclipse was happening? And what did the people tell you on the news and everybody was telling you about? Don't look directly in the sun. It's going to tear your eyes up. Think about it. We put people on the moon, right? You're not putting a man on the sun. It's not going to happen. Uh, scientists tell you, I don't know how they measure this stuff, but evidently they measure this stuff. I don't know how they come to this conclusion, but they said that at the core of the sun, it measures 27 million degrees Fahrenheit. That's, you're, you're evaporated. In an, you're going to be vaporized if you get to anywhere close to that, guys. 27 million degrees. And Malachi is saying, listen, that sun of righteousness, the same sun that warms the righteous, the same sun that gives life, to God's people is going to obliterate the wicked. The sun of righteousness is rising. I want to look at with you this idea of the day of the Lord, a few things about the day of the Lord. First of all, Malachi says, this day is a coming day. It is in the future. Verse 1, the day is coming. When is the day coming? I don't know when that day is coming. Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour of my coming. But he did say this, be ready because you don't know the day or the hour that I'm coming. Need to be ready. And what do we see around the globe today, guys? Look at, you turn on the news, you see what? Israel, chaos, darkness. You see wars in Ukraine, Israel, Middle East, China's rumbling, North Korea's rumbling, sabers rattling. Huh? Guess what? Have you seen what happened in New York, by the way? Again, I'm not, not political pulpit, but listen. What happened in New York? Huh? Well, they're dragging Israel's flag. They're burning Israel's flag. They're burning the flag of the United States of America. And they're saying that those who support Israel say, your time's done. Your time's done. This is happening in the United States of America on the streets of New York City, on the streets of of Washington, D.C. It's happening, guys. The church needs to open their eyes and see that the Lord, the day of the Lord, is coming. Jesus said in Luke chapter 21, verse 28, he said, and when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. Friends, this is the time for the church to look up Lift up their heads, because why? Your redemption is drawing nigh. Jesus is coming, friends. Look around the world. Open a newspaper. Turn on the news. You can see it. It's like the Bible is being lived out right before our very eyes. Lift up our heads, guys. What do we see? We see wars globally. 
We see earthquakes nationally. We see droughts locally. If these are not signs of the times, I don't know what is. Jesus, if you can determine the seasons and the weather, how do you not determine the seasons of the end of time? Hmm? Jesus said, this is the time to be watchful. This is the time to be ready. This is time to be about your father's business. Jesus said, watch and pray. Why? Because the spirit is strong, but the flesh is weak. This is the time for the church to take a stand. This is the time for the church to step up and be the light, be the salt that, we've, that he's called us to be. Anybody hear Sound of Freedom? You hear the, see the movie? Okay. Yeah. Huh? That's happening, guys. Women are being trafficked. Things are happening right here. Right here. Yes, even in Kansas, things are happening. What's the church doing? What are we doing? We are called to be doing something, to be being active. The day is coming, okay? Question, what am I more preoccupied with? Am I more preoccupied with the daily tasks and the daily rigmaroles of life or the fact that maybe there's 100,000 people going to the gates of hell? Or am I more worried about what's for dinner tonight? You see, my, where my priorities got to change. The question is to the pastor, do my priorities reflect the truth that the day is coming? Do your priorities reflect the truth that the day of the Lord is coming? It's rushing in, guys. The day is certain. Secondly, the day is consuming. Again, I told you it's bittersweet. He said, it's burning like an oven. This day is burning like an oven. This isn't the easy bake oven. This isn't grandma's oven. This is a burning, fiery furnace of an oven. This isn't the refiner's fire that we talked about a couple chapters ago. This is a relentless fire. This isn't the purifying fire. This is a painful fire. This isn't the comforting fire. This is a consuming fire. And who does it consume? There it says the proud. What keeps people from coming to Christ? What keeps people from coming to church? What keeps people from getting involved in anything that has to do with Jesus Christ? It's pride. Pride. Don't tell me about this Jesus stuff. Don't tell me about this Bible. I know better than that Bible. I know way better than that Jesus. I know how to run my own life. I'm a good person. I'm doing pretty well on my own. Pride keeps people from coming to Christ. Pride. Look at the totality and the finality of this. It says it's, le it's neither going to leave root or branch. That's everything. The is going to be consumed. The root is going to be consumed. That means, listen, friends, I would grow up Catholic. I, I told you. That means a root or branch. That means there's no purgatory. Grandma Mabel is not going to pray you out. Okay? There's no second chances. The Bible says man is appointed once to die, and after that, the judgment. That means there's no coming out of this fire. There's no, no withstanding this fire. Everything is going to be consumed from the branch to the very root. The Bible tells us, church, that God is a consuming fire. The Bible says that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The book of Revelation asks a great question in chapter 6, verse 17. It says, the great day of his wrath has come. Who is able to stand? Can you stand in the great day of his wrath? Who can stand next to a blazing furnace? Who can look into the eyes which are a flame of fire? Who can look at the holy righteous one who is clothed in pure linen and white garments with a girdle around his waist? Who can stand? There's only one person that can stand. The person who's clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is the only person that has a chance to stand when this day comes a burning oven. And before we're through, you have an opportunity to receive the gift of salvation. The third thing about the day, it's heralded. Verse 5 to 6, if you drop a little bit in your Bible, it's a heralded day. Behold, I'll send you a prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And I will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to the fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. There's a prophetic word here about the day of the Lord. 
and he talks about the fact that Elijah the prophet is coming. There's a dual fulfillment in this prophecy, church. Follow me here. When you turn the page of Malachi in your Bible, you see that blank page. Malachi closes. And what happens in that blank page of your Bible is 400 years of absolute silence. There is no prophetic word from Almighty God. 400 years of darkness, 400 years of silence. That's why Isaiah says the people were sitting in darkness. And what would happen then? After those 400 years, a baby's cry in Bethlehem would pierce the silence of the night. But before that baby cried, one came, preparing the way. There was a man, a wild man, in the Judean wilderness, in the night sky, crying out in the desert, eating locusts and honey, saying these words, prepare the way of the Lord. Repent. That was John the Baptist's message in one word. He says, repent, turn from your sins. He said to the Pharisees, he said, you brood of vipers. What did you come out here to see? Hmm? John the Baptist was the one who came, as the Bible says in Luke chapter 1, in the power, listen carefully, he wasn't Elijah, but he came in the power and the spirit of Elijah. Let me read to you Luke chapter 1, verse 17. The angel speaking to Zechariah about his son, John the Baptist, and it said this, and he will go before him, John the Baptist, in the spirit and the power of of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children. Jesus confirms this. Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. Listen to this. I tell you that Elijah has already come, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they pleased. Remember they had him beheaded? His head was served on a silver platter. Remember that? Jesus said Elijah came. How? In the form of John the Baptist, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. And as a little side note, church, that's our role. Do you know that? This is us. Voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Hey, what's your job, Pastor? I'm a voice. Hey, what's your job, Alan? I'm a voice. Hey, what's your job, Brother Larry? I'm a voice. That's all I am. I'm a voice saying, prepare the way of the Lord. That's what we're called to do. See, the Jewish people, they don't accept that. They don't accept the statements of Jesus right there. When you go to a Jewish meal at the Passover Seder, there's an empty chair sitting there. For Elijah, they are waiting for Malachi chapter 4 to be fulfilled. Okay, they're waiting on Elijah. Jesus said Elijah already came. How? In the power and the spirit of Elijah was John the Baptist. But hey, pastor, you may be asking your question, this question, well, is he going to come again? Or what's happening here? Dual fulfillment, remember? He came before Jesus was born the first time. I believe personally, and many others believe, that Elijah is going to come before the second coming of Jesus Christ when he returns to the earth. How? Revelation chapter 11, verse 6. Revelation chapter 11, verse 6. There are two witnesses during the great tribulation, right in the smack dab of the middle of the tribulation, two witnesses come onto the scene. Two prophets. Listen to how the prophets are described. One has the power to shut the heavens. No rain. The other has the power to turn rivers into blood with plagues. What prophet do you know in the Bible had the power to shut the heavens for three and a half years? Elijah. I believe those two prophets are Elijah and Moses. They're going to come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Can you be dogmatic about that? Can you be a matter of fact about that? Am I going to bite you tooth and nail about that? Absolutely not. But you just read that. I believe that that is Elijah and that is Moses. They will come. He will come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. This day is going to be heralded. It is going to be certain, and it's going to be consuming. 
Okay, that's the bitter part. Let's get to the sweet part. The rising of the sun on the righteous. This is where we want to be, guys. This is where we want to stand. Look at verse 2. But to you who fear my name, again, contrast, those who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like stall-fed calves. You shall trample the wicked, and they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. On the, di- on the day that I do this, says the Lord of hosts. Do you see the beautiful, not beautiful, but do you see the contrast? The proud are scorched. The humble, those who fear the Lord, are healed. Where do you want to be? Do you want to be in the burning oven? Or do you want to be in the healing rays? I want to be in the healing rays. The literal translation here for the verse 2, it says this. There will be healing in his beams or his rays. You know, it says wings there, and we automatically go to the bird, bird wings. No, the, the idea is beams, like the sun, beams of light shining forth from the sun of righteousness. Just like that sun can bring death, that sun can bring life to everything that it touches. How is there healing in his wings? What did Jesus say? He said, I came to give them life, not just eternal life, but abundant life. What does that mean? John 10, 10, I've not come to give you life, but abundant life. It means I want to give you meaning. I want to give you purpose. I want to give you love. I want to give you your, what your soul long for, longs for. Why do we see so many teenagers committing suicide today? Why is there this thing about young people about 17 to, to 20 years old committing suicide all over the place? Why? They don't have life. They don't have abundant life. They don't have meaning. They don't have purpose. They don't, th- there's, there's no rhyme or reason to anything, and there's no hope for the future. There's healing in his wings, friends. You know what else there's in his wings? There's health. You know, look, it says there in verse 2, you're going to go out. You're going to go out. What does that mean? You're going to be free. How many people today are are bound up with addiction, bound up with the chains of depression, bound up with the chains of anxiety. And Jesus said, when the sun of righteousness shines with healing in his wings, those chains are going to be gone. There's going to be healing. How many people can testify this morning? You know what? I was that. Jesus Christ has made me this. I was bound in pornography, but now I'm free. I was bound in alcohol, now I'm free bound in marijuana, and now I'm free. I was bound in depression, and now I'm free. Why? Because I was in the darkness, and what did I do? I stepped into the light. The healing is in his wings, and there's honor. He says, the wicked, you're going to trample over the wicked. Remember the idea last week? Hey, the wicked are prospering. Everybody's winning. The evil are, evil's just having their way. Guess what? No. He says, actually, the righteous are going to trample on the wicked. That's what, that's what it says. There's going to be healing. There's going to be health. There's going to be freedom. There's going to be honor. The curse is going to be reversed. There's going to be a healing worldwide. When? You say, I don't see that right now. No, we don't see that right now. When Jesus Christ comes back, the Bible says that he's going to come back and set up a thousand-year millennial reign here on this earth. And let me give you what Charles Haddon Spurgeon said about this. He said, in the sin-darkened world, we can have hope, knowing that the future coming of Jesus Christ will be like the dawning of the brightest day of curative sunshine. His appearance will be like a beautiful sunrise after a long, dark night. It will be a day of deliverance and spiritual light for the righteous, end quote. There's healing in his wings. Darkness will one day be vanished forever. Do you long for that day, church? I long for that day. There's not going to be evil. 
There's not going to be darkness. There's not going to be wickedness. There's not going to be children being abused. Listen, the Bible says in the book of Revelation that when that day comes, there's not going to be a need for a lamp. There's not going to be a need for a light because the lamb himself will be the light. What happens in that day, guys? No more temptation. No more fighting the flesh. No more fighting the enemy. No more fighting with the family. Our sanctification is going to be complete. The Bible tells us by his stripes we are healed. The Bible says he sent forth his word and he healed us. The Bible says he came to heal the brokenhearted. I have on my refrigerator a little picture that a girl back home sent me. It's a Valentine's card. It's all pink and has a big old heart on it. And it has that verse in it from Psalm, I think it's 144. It says he heals the broken hearted. Do you have a broken heart today? He can heal the broken heart. How many here, again, I'm giving testimony this morning. He's healed the corrupted mind. He's healed the broken marriage. He's healed a health issue. There is healing in his wings. And church, education can't do that for you. You can have the college degrees, you can have the PhDs, you can have the doctorate degrees, and that can't do that for you. There's no pharmaceutical drug company that can produce this for you. Money, the, no amount of money in this world can buy this for you. There's no piece of legislation that can go to Congress or past the president's desk that can bring healing like the son of righteousness. It can't be done. It can't be done in man's way. Remember, we're going through the book of Acts. It's been a while. But if you remember in the book of Acts, I believe it's chapter 3 or 4, there's Peter and John at the gate beautiful. Oh, it's a good story. Read it today. The gate beautiful. Something beautiful happens at the gate. There's a man, 40 years, sitting at the gate. And he, Peter and John are walking to the temple. They're going to worship. They're going to pray. They're going to the temple of the Lord. They're happy. And this guy, here's this guy. In alms. They've seen this guy probably a million times. Can I get some money? Peter and John said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have I give you. Rise up and walk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that man, it says, he went out, read, read the story, he went out leaping, praising, and shouting because he's walking. He thought he needed money. Peter and John said, you think you need money, but you don't need money. You need Jesus, and I'm going to give you that. And he says, rise up and walk in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he walked. Friends, there's healing in his wings. Do you know we're all sick? We're all sick with sin. We all need healing. Every single one of us have been infected with the disease of sin, and there's only one cure, and it is the blood of Jesus Christ applied to your life through faith. Friends, there's healing. What else is there? There's peace. When you step into the Son of Righteousness' light, there's peace. You say, look for peace today, and I don't really see a lot of peace going on. You just talked about war and all that other stuff. Hey, where, where's the peace? Well, the Prince of Peace came to bring peace, not worldwide peace like we think but peace with God. And friend, when you have peace with God, when you know everything is right with you and God, you can have an inner peace. There might be a war going on outside, but you can have an inner peace deep within your heart, knowing that everything is right with you and God. You can have peace with God, and you can have the peace of God. And how does that happen? The Bible says in Colossians that he's made peace, how? Through the blood of his cross, do you understand what that implication there, church? Do you understand what that's saying? It's saying this. If you want to go to hell, nobody wants to. You're going to have to trample over the dead body of Jesus Christ to get there. You're going to have to because he's already made peace through the blood of his cross. I still don't see the peace, pastor. Again, future. Isaiah chapter 11, millennial kingdom. It says this. Listen to this combination. 
the wolf and the lamb and the leopard and the baby goat will lie down together. You put them together right now, what's happening? Baby goat's gone. In the millennial kingdom, there's going to be that type of peace. It's going to be a wonderful thing. Friends, there's healing in his wings. There's healing from sin. There's healing from war. There's healing from anxiety. And there's healing, listen to this, ultimately from death. Jesus said in John chapter 11, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. And even though you die, you shall live. He said, then do you believe that? Friends, people ask me, what are you going to do in the millennial reign? I don't know. The Bible simply says you're going to rule and reign. What does that mean? I don't know. It just says you're going to rule and reign. What are the wicked going to do? It says they're going to burn in everlasting torment. That's what it says. And may I digress just for a moment. Just for a moment. It says, listen, if you are in darkness right now, you know what I mean by that? If you're in a season right now of your life of just hardship, you don't see any relief, maybe you've been sick for a long, long time, Maybe kids are in rebellion. Maybe it's a financial situation. And you say, I just can't see any light right now. It's nothing but darkness. Darkness is just drowning your life right now. I just invite you right now for this real quick moment. Just pray this simple prayer. Lord Jesus, would you open my heart again and allow your light to shine in and cast that darkness out and let me see your light because there's healing in that. Last thing, there's joy in the Son of Righteousness. You know, this time of year when the, you know, we change the clocks back and it gets dark at like 5.30, they suffer from this thing called sad, seasonal, effective disorder. You know, the darkness is something to them. It's dark when they wake up. It's dark when they come home from work. It's all just all dark, 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 dark. And they start, to get, they start to get down and they start to get depressed. Can I just say this? Friends, there's joy in Jesus Christ. Where are we going to sing joy to the world? Hmm? Where's joy found? The Bible tells us in Psalm 16, in your presence is fullness of joy. Joy is not found out there. Joy is not found in what I have in my bank. Joy is found in the Son of Righteousness. And you say, listen, Pastor, you don't understand the situation right now in my life. You don't understand the diagnosis I just had. You don't understand what my family's going through right now. I don't understand. But I do understand this. The Bible declares it so. If you are in Christ Jesus, listen carefully. This, this right now, is as much of hell that you'll ever taste. There's a day coming, friends. There is healing in his wings. Let me just give you three takeaways. And as the worship team comes up, I want you to just think about this idea. I let, hope, hopefully I just want your appetite to for more of this. God, and you go into the Bible yourself, you start searching and you start praying and you start taking things for yourself. But just let me give you three things. The son of righteousness. Think about the son. Let the son be your center. This Christmas season, let the son be the center of everything that you do. Let him be the center of your marriage. Let him be the center of your family. Let him be the center of this church. Let him be the center of everything. And let him be your light. You say, Lord, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how I'm going to get through. I don't know where I'm going from here. Allow his light to shine the way and follow that light. And then, as we get through this season, guys, what are we called to do as believers? Reflect the light. I receive the light, and I reflect the light. So let him be your center. Let him be your light, and let us reflect that light. I just want to leave you with these words. We just sang that song. Maddie and Austin were just messing with me a little earlier. They're like, 
That's a hard song to sing a little bit if your voice is a little bit rough in the morning. Hark the herald angels sing. That hymn is steeped in truth. Listen to the words. I hope you catch them. Hail the heaven-born Prince of Peace. Hail the Son of Righteousness. Light and life to all he brings, risen with healing in his wings. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for the Son of Righteousness, Lord, shining on each one this morning. in our minds. But Lord, I just personally pray right now, if there is anybody, Lord, here who says, I don't know what would happen when that day comes. When the day of the Lord comes, I don't know where I would stand. Lord, that today would be the day they would know with assurance that they can stand on that day in Jesus Christ. And I just pray, Lord, for anybody here this morning as well who have they've just been in darkness. They've been just captured by something in their life which is just holding them down. I pray, Lord, that today, by the power of the Spirit of God working in this place this morning, that, Lord, that they would say, today is a day where I am choosing to receive Christ and recommit my life, if that is necessary, and to step back in. I am tired of living in the darkness. I am tired of living in the chains. And today, Lord Jesus Christ, I want to experience healing that only comes from you, shining your light into my life. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.